morning. I think we'll start now, and uh, we have plenty of time. <laughs> we usually only have two hours, but I think we have four or 15 hours. I don't know how many. So uh, let us stand, and uh, Mrs. Whitbeck, would you want to introduce us and welcome us or whatever? I'd like to welcome you to Collingswood Bible Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you could be here today, and we hope that you enjoy all the meetings, which I'm sure will be very fulfilling. Also, if you don't know, there's two ladies' bathrooms in the back. There's a, a little one that's in the hallway on the back, if you don't like walking back there. And then there's two upstairs in case they get filled. All right. So we'd like to welcome you, the ladies of the church. Uh, one of the, my favorite Bible verses is Philippians 4, 4 through 8. And I often thought if we as ladies would just follow these verses in our daily lives, that we would be uh, filled with joy, for one thing. Also, when other people see us, they would see a Christian. And sometimes... Uh, When they look at us in our worst moments, we don't show that. So Philippians 4 through 8 is rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And I don't know about you, but there's a little song that the kids sing, uh, a chorus, and that's one of my favorite choruses. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And my husband passed away about three years ago. And this is one of the verses that I can honestly say was a great blessing to me. That I never felt that despair. Uh, that other people do. I just felt the peace of God in my heart. And that was a good testimony to other people. And then, of course, the last verse, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And in today's world, as you've been watching television lately, it's very hard to keep your mind on the Lord because we don't see things that are pure and virtuous and kind. Uh, so if we take these four verses, uh, I once taught a lesson and uh, the title of it was Poise. And as Christian women, we should have poise. We shouldn't be willy-nilly all over the place. And these four verses, if we took them to heart, we would be lovely Christian women of virtue. So welcome, ladies. I hope you enjoy yourself, and uh, I'll see you around. Thank you. Thank you. I've come to uh, know Mrs. Whitbeck, and she's she's a dear lady. We sort of laugh together but mostly we don't aren't together so we don't laugh too much so I want to start uh, with a song I get everything all my name is Yvonne Wade I'm Dr. Wade's wife for uh, quite a few years I think it's almost 68 so long that I can't count <laughs> I always I won't count start out by singing All for Jesus. This is page 360 of this hymn book here. This is their first hymn book they sing out most of the time. They got new hymn books, but they think they like the old ones better. Because whenever I come here, they sing out the old ones. Hi, Trish. Glad to see you. Glad to see all of you. Hi. I saw your husband come in, but I thought maybe you weren't with him because you're trailing behind. <laughs> Parking the car. <laughs> I have the wrong tape. 
page. It's supposed to be all for Jesus. Oh, not here. My mother taught this to me and to my sisters, and she taught us to sing uh, the whole verse, the whole song. So I wanted to sing it, and I was so glad to see it was in the hymn book. Uh, a girl, a woman wrote the words, Mary D. James, and we don't know who wrote the, the words. Shall we stand up, please? Ready? All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my being ransom. Tammy Wade is going to have a hymn story for us. And Chris Grumblad is going to give her testimony. And then Barbara Lee Master is going to be our main speaker, and she's going to talk on textual matters. So I'm looking forward to these speeches today. I'm looking forward to this fellowship. And uh, we appreciate all of you, and we love you in the Lord. We're very glad you come to the meeting, that you can stand with your husbands or with your Fathers or whoever, your husbands. I said that already. I have two husbands someplace. (laughs) But you can stand with them in the text. It's very important. And when my husband first uh, started defending the King James Bible and the Greek and the Hebrew that underlies it, that's the important part. It's the, the best Greek, the best Hebrew of all the other translations. That's why we like the King James. And then the good translators. So when he starts... Uh, talking about this I didn't know anything he was talking about it was all like a foreign language to me and um, that's one reason I wanted Barbara to speak because she just started reading this and all of a sudden she was talking like a champion champion defender of the word of God and I thought I wanted her to share this with you I wanted Tammy to help give her her great burden she has for good music in the church 
and I wanted to hear Chris's testimony because I, I don't, I've never heard her testimony and I wanted to hear it. I'm sure you do too. But one of the big things, the great exciting things about Chris, she came this year as a grandmother. <laughs> and she has her baby and, her, and the baby's mother here. But it's real good to have a brand new grandmother in our midst. Okay. Uh, so I want us to, uh, I have it all written down here. Oh, but this is going to be prayer time. I don't want to push the prayer at the end of the time. And see, we have a lot more time than usually. Usually we start at 10. And uh, so now we have a whole lot of extra time. But I don't want to waste it. We're supposed to redeem the time. Uh, I called some people and asked them what their prayer requests were. I called everybody, but everybody wasn't home. Everybody means the women, the, the wives of the people there on the executive committee and council. I pray, called up Jackie Hawes and I'm, I heard from Tammy because Tammy had been, Tammy Wade had been talking with her and that they share the similar uh, sick, uh, I'll call it a sickness but it's not really a sickness. It's just a, help me Tammy, what do you share with, with what's it called? I can't hear. Okay. So, Parathyroid, that's the word. I have it written here, but I can't find I can't follow. I get nervous and I can't even read. You wouldn't know I'm standing up here reading read lists. <laughs> so Jackie Hawes, she lives in Colorado and they come every every uh, year. So we want to pray for her. I I'm I'm gonna I don't know you all real well, but I'm gonna ask who will pray for Jackie Hawes in her her uh, soon surgery. She's having a surgery on the nineteenth of August. Who? Okay, Tammy will pray for her. Then uh, Gail Howard, I thought she might be here. I called her up, and she hardly ever gets to come to anything because, you know, she has a son, Steve, and he's in his 30s, and he needs complete care. I forget exactly what his, uh, his uh, condition is. He's a wonderful Christian young man, but he needs to be 24-hour care. And uh, her husband is uh, uh, David Hollywood. And they said they were coming, but I didn't see them. But they could be hiding someplace. And uh, she, this is uh, who. Uh, when you pray for Gail, I want she needs personal care challenge for Steve. He needs a 24-hour uh, day care. They have to get people all the time, and need for helpers and attendants. And Gail is not able to help 24/7 like she used to do. So uh, this is uh, his name is Steve Hollywood, and her name is Gail, the mother. Who will pray for Gail Hollywood? Don't be afraid to volunteer because none of us know. We don't know each other real well here. You know, thank you, Gail Hollywood. And uh, then uh, I called up uh, a doctor. I think he's a doctor. Jim, James, James Johnson. He's, he's with the, uh, help me, what he's with. The science thing. Yeah, creation research. And, uh, and I call, talked to him, and I said I'd call his wife, and I called her, but she didn't answer the phone. A lot of people don't answer the phone. They just put their message on. Of course, we have that, too, but we answer the phone also. <laughs> but uh, so uh, my husband rang. We have a buzzing system, and I, he said, this Sherry Johnson's on the phone. I thought, oh, who's Sherry Johnson? She's glad you called her. Who did I call? <laughs> because I never knew her first name was Sherry. And she talked to me, and it was very interesting. And she said, oh, I'm so glad you called for prayer. And all the while, I'm thinking, who is she? <laughs> and then it, it came that she was uh, Dr. Johnson's wife, and she wants us to pray. And I was really amazed. She said, I want you and the women to pray for godly, more godly judges in this country. You know, I never thought of praying for hardly anything like that. We need godly judges in federal courts and administrative judges. They rule in, our un, in an ungodly matter, manner. We need men who revere the Lord and know the Lord as judges. So that, I was, usually people say, pray for me, my toes out of joint. Pray for me, my daughter goes to school. But this was a great big, big prayer. You know, a big, big request. And we think about praying for our president and governors and things like that. But for more godly judges, who will volunteer to pray for more? Okay, good. I'll read it again. So, uh, we need godly judges in federal courts 
as in, and administrative judges. They rule in an ungodly manner, and we need them to revere the Lord and know the Lord. So uh, then uh, let's pray for the speakers as they speak. That was one of the, I, I think I called uh, uh, that lady over there. <laughs> Phyllis, yes. I didn't, I, I, okay, I called her, and uh, she said, uh, pray for the speakers. I thought, that's a good idea. We should pray for the speakers. Uh, they study all year long. They have, they take a stand, and uh, and many of us have them for husbands or good friends, and they need our prayer support. We forget how much it goes into this, just to have a meeting, not alone to speak. Pastor Dan Waite, he just works probably two days straight, just getting things ready in here, and uh, and other people that help him. So uh, I will pray for. I can't even remember what I'm talking about. Okay, good. Hope you remember what I'm talking about. So let's pray now. If you pray, stand up so we all can hear you. You can pray in the order that you volunteer.
stand up. Hi, Gail. You can pray now if you want to, if you have something on your heart or burden. You can stand up and pray now. It's not required. Okay. Lord, you know that our family is going to be traveling to Ghana tomorrow for a over week um, in a third world country. And they're going to be ministering there at a little Christian school. And Lord, how we pray that this will be a ministry that is just glorifying you in every way. We thank you for all that you've done to prepare this group and we ask that you'll give them travel and safety. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. Anyone else want to pray for something in your heart? Dear Father in heaven, we're so grateful we have you for Heavenly Father because we've come to Jesus. He's our Savior. Some have never had an earthly father. I had a wonderful earthly father, but now he's with thee. Some days, it's the only place I can go, Lord, to tell you, my heavenly father, my heart is crying. I'm sure these women feel the same way. So I pray for each woman here. I don't know all of them real well. Some I know better than others. But, oh God, you know them. You know them. You know their hearts. You know their needs. You know their cares. You know their joys. You know their sadness. You know whether they're. You know the length of their life. Dear Lord, we thank you that we have life, that we can stand here, surprising as it is, and be as old as we are, and able to serve you. I pray for each woman here. Each woman here has a happiness, a joy sadness, a grief. And buried down deep in our hearts, there are griefs that are buried there. And once in a while, they pop out. And so we think of the Savior who bore all our griefs. And we thank you for Jesus. So today I pray for the men who are going to preach and teach, that you open their hearts, that you open their minds with remembrance. Dear Father, we pray that they will be a blessing to us because how we need to be taught. We pray for the women today who are speaking, for Tammy, as she tells us on her, on her heart, as Chris, as she shares her, her salvation and her, her daily life and whatever you've given her, her heart to tell us, we pray for her. Pray for Barbara, I'm glad you brought her into our lives. We didn't know her last year. And this year we've been drawn to her because of her great need for books about this subject that this, this whole Dean Burnett Society talks about. So open her up to us, Lord, in a very special way. In Jesus' name, amen. So now I want to have uh, Tammy give her uh, talk. And right after that, we can speak. I mean, speak to Barbara. And I won't get up and say anything between. But don't want to understand. I'm so glad you came. Well, Tammy's coming up here. Why don't you tell me your names? So we'll start right over here with Gail.
She's one of my people that I love. I don't mean that, not that I don't love the rest of you. <laughs> and the way in the back, Chris. Good. We have the, she, she won the baby and the youngest, the prize for the youngest. Fix the I don't have any prize. Okay. Tammy's coming up to kick her oh, She knows I was, so, Oh, you lost the folder. I was going to say she's afraid I would never <laughs> stop. <laughs> oh, I don't need the symbol now. Either. Okay. Oh, I was instructed to be sure the speakers put that on. <laughs> Hi. What's your name? Anna who? Oh, she belongs to Hannah. Oh, she's Hannah. You grew up since last year. <laughs> Not that I would have recognized you. Anyhow, we were in their church. Uh, I'm supposed to be sure. Okay. Thank you. Anna, is that you up there? Is that what you doing okay? Hi, Justine. There's Justine, too. Oh, okay. I can't, I can't, I'm talking to Justine. Where's Anna? She's behind the equipment. You oh, can't really see her. Okay. Good morning, ladies. Um, I, when I thought about doing a song, I was thinking about doing one that everyone did not know. And uh, that wasn't uh, something from the 1800s. But I decided on this one. Um, but as I was um, deciding on this one, I thought... You know how today a lot of people say we want a new song. Um, and the Lord does say that we are to uh, sing a new song unto the Lord. However, the understanding of new song is not quite what people think it is today. And um, what, what I have found, um, there was a book that I read and um, it, it, basically the definition of a new song is one that comes from a new heart um, so it's it's the song of the redeemed um, it's a changed type of song anyway so that being said I chose how firm a foundation now upon first looking at it and a lot of you if you haven't really looked too much into it you may have heard that it was written by John Rippon now John Rippon was a compiler of hymns in the 1700s and uh, he put together he was he and his he was let me start by saying he was a uh, a Baptist pastor in the London in London and um, he served there for six decades now um, he and his church his congregation were users of or they were lovers let's say of the Isaac Watts hymns and Isaac Watts has categorized his hymns in a certain way um, and there were also psalms and there were hymns um, but he categorized them in different biblical topics but as um, Dr. Rippon and his congregation were looking and using those hymns and they were um, they were not trying to um, turn away from that but they wanted to have uh, people actually, um, excuse me, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, they, wanted, they wanted to cover some of those topics that Dr. Watts had omitted um, because uh, there were some. And so there wasn't anything new except some of these, um, let's just say, the, let, me, let me give you the name. It's a very long name of the hymnal that uh, John Rippon had actually published. It's called um, a Selection of Hymns from the Best Authors Intended to be an Appendix to Dr. Watts' Psalms and Hymns by John Rippon A.M. I guess that's his degree. I don't really know what it means. Um, and most believe the authors of the words um, of how firm a foundation was intentionally anonymous. Now, on occasion, um, what it says as far as the authorship of the hymn, it says K dash. And when there's a dash, when when there's no actual signific, sign, signification of the person's name, um, 
you know, at least in his compilation of hymns, it generally means that it maybe, maybe has been edited somewhat by John Rippon himself, or possibly the person wanted to be anonymous, which could be the case. Anyway, uh, moving on from that, I don't want to spend all my time talking about the background, but just that to say, we don't really know who wrote it. Uh, it's possible it could have been a song leader in his church. And um, also, we know um, that the, the song had many tunes, even from the time that it was, when it was first uh, initiated. Um, there were at least three tunes in the 1700s in England. Now, in England, the only people that would sing the song were um, particular Baptists. Or not Baptists, particular Baptists, but Baptists. And um, the Congregationalists uh, rarely sang it. The uh, Church of England generally did not sing it. And the Presbyterian and the... Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember the other church... Um, do not, did not sing it at all. The Wesleyans, they would not sing it. They refused to sing it. Um, so when it came to this country, and it came almost immediately because it was, it was published in 1787, um, when it came to this country, the, um, it, it took only five years for publishers in New York to actually print it again. And from there, it had actually made uh, 27 copies it was re reprinted 27 times and with a, at that time it, this would be a very large number 200,000 printings so um, now I, I do want to talk more about the song itself that's why I gave you the, the hymn um, aside from it being a personal favorite of mine it has always spoke uh, has spoken to me because of the scriptures that are used um, if you look at the first stanza, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said? You to who, unto Jesus for refuge have fled. The promise of Second Peter 1.4 whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partaker of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So these promises that God has given us in his word, are some of them the author has talked about in this song. Um, the second stanza is not very common not very well known in every condition of sickness and health and poverty's veil or abounding in wealth at home and abroad on the land on the sea as thy days may demand shall thy strength ever be I'm sure you will recognize the verse Deuteronomy 33:25. thy shoes shall be as iron, shall be iron, iron and brass and as thy days so shall thy strength be and then stanza, the third stanza here, uh, Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed, for I am thy God, I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Uh, it's taken directly from Isaiah 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. And these are, these are promises that um, the author wants us to focus on. And as we rest in and consider what God has said in these verses, we're able to see the worth of God's word. And then the, the next stanza, another one that we generally have in our hymnals. When thou through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of woe shall not thee overflow. For I will be with thee thy troubles to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And the, through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. 
Isaiah 43.2. I mean, we know that both of these passages are, and also the one in Deuteronomy are written to Israel, but they are also, we can apply them in a, in a spiritual sense to ourselves today. Um, and then um, another popular verse, When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then... This is a new one to me. This, this, uh, there were actually seven stanzas, and the sixth stanza is not one that I knew. Um, Even down to old age, all my people shall prove my sovereign, eternal, unchangeable love. And when hoary hairs shall their temples adorn, like lambs they shall still in my bosom be born. And it reminds me of Isaiah 46, 4. Even to your old age I am he, and even to whore hairs will I carry you. I have made, and I will bear, and I will carry, and will deliver you. Isaiah 46, 4. And then the last verse has a particular blessing of meaning. And when you're in any sort of trial that sometimes we just can't relate to each other, we just don't know how. Um, sometimes we feel forsaken by all others, but God has never forsaken us and will never forsake us. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. And that's from Hebrews 13:5. We can all sing it. Should we all sing it? Oh, I don't I don't have it. Three twenty five. Okay. Page three twenty five.
everything be okay? Good morning. I'll try not to be clunky here. And okay, is that loud enough? But not too loud. I think it's okay. Way up there. Am I good? <laughs> well, it's nice to be back. We missed last year, and I I don't even remember how many years we've been coming here. But I think last year was the first time since we started that we've ever missed. My husband was having some issues with his heart, nothing major, but he had to go through several heart procedures and none of them worked. He's here today by the grace of the Lord because the problems were never resolved, but he's fine. Doctor said carry on. He's he's doing so much better than he did last year when we thought we couldn't do anything anymore. So I'm basically sharing just a little bit of my own personal testimony, but I'm tying it in with the King James Bible because that's where I'm at now. And there's nothing really remarkable about my testimony. The, the, probably the most remarkable thing is that growing up, I grew up in a house with the King James Bible. That's all we had. That's all we used. But we were just religious. Even I'm not even we were sure. I'm not even sure we were good at being religious. But we had a devotional book in the house, and we had a King James Bible, and we went to church on Sundays, and the usual, usual, usual for people that don't really know the Lord. And that's how I grew up. But I had a grandmother who was very heavily involved in the occult. And I loved this grandmother. And I didn't really understand what all of that was, except that I liked all this supernatural stuff that I was seeing, and it gave me a real hunger for it, and I wanted that. Well, I can look back now and tell you that that's where I see the, the hand of the Lord being on my life when I didn't know it. Because I tried to get involved in this stuff. My grandmother had books that when she passed away, I tried to get my hands on those books and they just mysteriously disappeared. <laughs> I wanted the magazines. I wanted everything that she had so I could learn all this stuff. My mother knew better. She warned my grandmother, yes, she can come and visit you, but don't you tell her any of this stuff and don't you share. Well, that's like telling a Christian, you know, yeah, you can have your granddaughter over, but don't you share the Lord with her. If you believe what you believe, you're going to share it. And that was a problem. So it wasn't until I was 27 years old when I actually understood what all of this meant. And I was sitting, now I'm going to tell you some, you're going to laugh at some of the things because I'm going to tell you some of the churches where I've been. I got saved in the Assemblies of God Church. Oh, <laughs> I'm in a Baptist church now. And you tell people your background and they're like, oh, you were one of them. Well, I was a new Christian. I didn't know what I didn't know. I only knew what I was taught. And I went to that church carrying my King James Bible because that's what I knew. And another name I'll throw out there is the PTL Club. That's what I watched at home on the television. I didn't know any better. You wouldn't catch me turning that stuff on now, but that's what I had. And they were selling a PTL ver version of the open Bible, King James Version. So I got one. That was my first real Bible that I read in, studied in, wrote in, underlined. I still have that Bible. Forty-some years later, I still have that one. And then another one I can throw out there is, um, and I just went blank right when I was going to say it. Oh, don't you love that? Okay. Yeah, join, yes, I'm joining that group. <laughs> I'm finding out. <laughs> Well, I'll skip that part and move on to the 
as I was in this church and learning and growing about the Lord, um, I was having trouble understanding things, and I was asking a lot of questions. I found out that sometimes when you ask a lot of questions in a church, you can become quite the enemy of the leadership. Because I was one of those, I'm all, I always want to know the absolute truth about everything. Don't give me rhetoric and don't patronize me. Oh, that's the worst thing you can do to me. I want the truth. And I was on this quest for truth and I just asked hundreds and hundreds of questions. And my pastor at the time would get so frustrated with me. I think in that church they have seven topics. And that's all they know. And they don't go beyond those seven topics. And you hear them over and over and over and over. Maybe with a different title, but it's the same message, same topic. And I had so many questions, and I wanted answers. And I really didn't understand a, a good prayer life at that time. So I really didn't understand how to get the answers by just reading the Bible and praying. And I, I figured that one out because I took my Bible, I took all the books that I had, I went off into the woods one day with a camper, spent about 10 days out there by myself. I read through the King James Bible twice, and I read every book I could get my hands on. I was just like a sponge. I was like a reading machine. I, I was taught speed reading, so I read fast. I still do that. And I came back with, of course, more questions. That was getting me in a lot of trouble, and eventually I figured out I, I don't really belong here because I'm finding out things from the Lord and from His Word that they're not teaching me here, and every time I bring it up, I'm getting one of these. You know, you don't ask those kind of questions. So I, I stopped, and eventually I moved on. Now my, my husband also got saved in an Assemblies of God church. He's much worse than I am about his quest for truth. That's why he's a Bible teacher. I think that's what the Lord does to Bible teachers. And he would accept nothing except the truth. And he that's why he studies continuously. And it was his background and my background come together for a little while made us a, a bit obnoxious to people, really. It's truth seekers have a an ability to be obnoxious and we had to learn how to calm that down and the Lord had of course the Lord works with you over the years and in time and as you walk with them but in all of these churches we kept being handed all these other Bibles you know oh read this one it'll help you understand better well the first one they gave me was an NIV Okay, you know, I'll take this one home, and I started reading it. Okay, it was easier reading. It was, I'll admit it, and I probably learned some things. I think the Lord can use anything. You'll figure that one out in a minute. He can use anything and anyone. And then, of course, my own husband was like, oh, there's this new revised standard edition. That's what I really like. That's, I'll get you one. So he got me one of those. It's still in the box, I think. <laughs> and then the next one that came along was the, uh, no, there was the Revised Standard. Then, oh, then there was the New Revised Standard. Then there was the New American Standard. And I'm, I'm going through all of these, and I'm, I'm, I still have all these questions. Well, of course, you know, today I still have a whole bunch of questions. I don't think those ever go away, especially if you really want to know the Lord and you really want to know the truth. Those don't go away. That's just part of my life. I'm sure that's part of your life. But I wasn't finding correctness in what I was looking for. I wasn't finding correctness. And then of all people, you'll love this name, of all the people that I listened to on the radio and on the television and all these programs, the one that made me see the light and figure out what was wrong was Gail Ripplinger. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? She was talking about the, the, all the uh, problems with the NIV, and she was talking about the New Age versions and all the things that were wrong with them. And I was all ears, and I think I sat there with eyes like saucers, like, oh, this is really true. Then 
this is where all my answers are. I have to go back, you know, if all of this was really true. And so one day when my husband came home, I said, you have to hear this lady that I heard. I said, I already ordered the book and the videos, and it'll, it'll be here in a few days, and we'll watch it and we'll listen to it. And my husband was, when he was teaching the Bible, he was using these other versions, but his problem was, he knew the King James. And people kept saying the King James was too difficult to understand, but he'd try to use these other versions, and then he found himself saying, reading it and then saying, but that really means, and then he'd tell you what the King James means. They were either too complicated, too many words, to tr- you know, because they have to change the words so many times, they were too complicated, he'd go back and explain it using the King James. He'd use the NIV, and that would soften everything so much it wasn't strong enough. So then he'd go back, and, you know, and he's even saying, you know, none of these versions are working out. They're just not saying what the King James Version says. But you kind of go along, and you know something's wrong. You don't quite know what it is. Well, we got our tape, our videotape, and we got our book, and my husband and I sat down and watched it together, and that, it, that was the pivotal point in our lives, watching that and listening. And I think it was the same, within the same week or two that my husband started doing research and came across the Dean Bergon Society, which we've been to ever since that day. The main thing that... I wanted to stress um, when learning all of this was I was listening to who Westcott and Hort were. It got to the point where if I tried to talk to other people, sometimes this stuff just gets overwhelming and it gets a little technical and we listen to the, you know, I leave all that stuff to these guys that are coming out later today because they're the experts. For me, it was a much more practical issue when I learned who Westcott and Hort really were. Okay, they wrote the corrupt text, right? And every that's where all the modern translations come from. Who are Westcott and Hort? Well, they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. That's all I had to know. I didn't even have to know anything else. I'm like, that's the central message of the Bible. If they don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, how are they writing a text that they're going to get Bibles from that we're supposed to lean, learn and read from? How can I learn anything about the Lord from somebody who doesn't believe in the resurrection? I was so mad. I was livid. And I took my, I had a leather bound NIV, really nice one, and I was just, you should have, I was silly. I was just, and I was ripping that thing apart, and I couldn't, couldn't rip the binding, and I couldn't do anything. So I started ripping pages, and I just was so angry over it. I took the whole Bible, and I threw it in the trash. Well, my husband came out later, and he was like, oh, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done that. He said, I save all those versions, because, and he does. He's like, mine was one of the first ones that were ever printed, and he likes the origin, original ones. But he likes the copies and the copies and the copies and I copy. We have so many versions of so many Bibles downstairs on our bookshelves. I can't even count them. I keep buying more bookshelves to make more room for them all because he likes to go back and refer to them. Of course, you know, if you want to show somebody what it says and then tell them what it really says in God's Word, you have to do that. You have to have them all. So the one uh, scripture that... I typed wrong and it says Chris instead of Christ. Now, how do you like that typo? First Corinthians fifteen fourteen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain. Your faith also is in vain. There's the resurrection of Christ. Paul said, if we, you know, if we don't have the resurrection of Christ, then everything else that we do doesn't matter anyway. And Westcott and Hort didn't delete that one from their text, which was amazing. I went through 24 Bible versions looking at this. And even though they're all worded differently, they basically say the same thing. But they don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ. So that was a little confusing. I thought, they knew what they were doing. They knew that they were deceiving people. This was an agenda. 
They knew what they were doing. And they did it anyway. And they left that verse in. And it was, I thought, well, that's really ironic. That's the verse that they would leave in. And it's in every modern translation. Nobody took it out. But they don't believe in it. So when I, I went a little bit further, of course, and found out they were involved in the occult, which, of course, I had been completely delivered from by the time I finally understood the truth and really met with the Lord. And so... I knew, of course, what the occult was, so I knew what they were doing. I knew what they were involved in, and the ghostly guild, and the church that they were involved in. And I, so for me, it was a no-brainer. It's like, wait a minute. All the new texts, all the new versions come from this text that Westcott and Hort wrote. This is who they are. You can't possibly want a Bible written from the text that these guys put together. And that's still my bottom line. Leave it to all these guys to give you all the technical details. But who wants, if you want to know the Lord, if you really want to know the Lord and who he is and what he says, faith is simply believing the word of God. Taking God at his word. His word. Not the word of Westcott and Hort, who made it all up to fit their agenda. And, and so all these versions, my, my bottom line, my ending line here is a famous quote from some anonymous person on Facebook. This is what they wrote. You can collect rotten eggs from everywhere, but it will still never make a good omelet. Thank you, ladies. Barbara LeMaster. Uh, I have my friends passing out uh, a handout, which is the definitions we will be going over, and copies of Dr. Waite's book, The Heresies of Westcott and Hort. If you do not get one, see me, and I will make sure that you get a free copy. Chris's testimony is interesting because I could just go, ditto. I was raised King James and forayed for a while out into the NIV and read Gail Ripplinger, who put me back in my King James. And at the same time, I was introduced to Dr. Cecil Carter, beloved man of God. Never met the man. We spent hours on the telephone. And I have everything he ever wrote. And I got a good education in West Cotton Court. I have been in South Jersey since 1985. I have lived within a half an hour of Dr. Waite for 30 years. Never met the man until September last year. Never knew he existed. <laughs> I was reading uh, David Cloud's book, Faith, Birth is the Modern Versions, and he kept referencing this G.A. Waite, and I'm going, who is this? Never heard of the man. Um, but he referenced his books and said it was a Bible for today, which also meant nothing to me. And I'm going, I have over 6,100 books in my own personal library. Uh, let's get a few more. So I called up Dr. Waite. Well, I didn't know that I was doing that. But I called the telephone number that uh, David Cloud had in the back of his book and there was a voice on the other end that said Bible for today, Pastor Waite speaking, and the rest, as they say, is history. Um, I had an issue with the church I was attending at the time. They went to the English Standard Version, ESV. I didn't know anything about it because I'd been in my King James for quite some time again. 
And um, Dr. Wade has a thousand titles. I have a few of them. I sat down. I am retired. I have nothing to do but read. For five months, I read 15,000 pages of everything I could get my hands on. $1,500 later, I had the general idea of what was going on. So that's kind of how I got to where I am. How many of you remember the TV show To Tell the Truth? There was a panel of, ex- of judges who had to determine who was the real person out of all the imposters. My speech is entitled, Will the Real Heretic Please Stand Up? I'm going to give you some information, and from that information at the end, you will determine who is the real from the imposters. Several words I'm sure you're going to hear today and tomorrow, more than once, are heretic, heretical, and heresy. We need to know what they mean in order to use them properly. There's the historical meaning of the word and the circumstances that brought it about. There's the dictionary word, and then there's the biblical definition. And I will also end up discussing the connection that all this has with textual criticism. Dr. Karen King is a professor at Harvard Divinity. She's uh, Harvard trained. Is the foremost Christian Gnostic in the United States. The name of her book is What is Gnosticism? And if you want a first-hand account to know really what's going on in Gnosticism, you need to read Karen King and Elaine Pagel. Heresy started out in ancient medical writers as a term to denote a coherent doctrine or tendency often applying it to the variety of ancient philosophical teachings or schools of thought tied to a particular founder and his successors. And now you know why there's a handout and why it's printed, so you can go back and reference it. It was a largely positive understanding of the word. The Christians gave it a negative bent. By applying the Greek concept of the difference between reality and the naming of something, there could be the distinguishing between true and false believers. They reasoned that the heretics were not in reality Christians, they just called themselves Christians, despite the fact that their beliefs and practices were contrary to the teachings of Christ. This led to the concepts of orthodoxy and heresy. Those who ended up on the orthodox end got to determine what truth was. This created an us-them mentality. Even though the heretics claimed to be Christians, by excluding them, the Christians denied part of what it meant to be a Christian. To exclude those who claimed to belong meant to divide the whole in the interests of purity. The heretics had a knowledge, but it was a knowledge falsely so called. Irenaeus of Lyon, one of the great church fathers, in his book, Exposé and Overthrow of What is Falsely Called Knowledge, It's the major work from which we understand the heresy of the early church that was to become known as Gnosticism. The Gnostics rejected the God of the Hebrew Bible as the true God and creator of the cosmos. They denied the divine goodness of both the creator and the creation. They denied that Jesus had a physical body and that he rose from the dead. They claimed that only a spiritual elite would be saved by nature owing to their heavenly origin. Salvation came through knowledge revealed only to them. Humanity was ignorant and needed to be enlightened with true teaching. Impurity must be cleansed and evil resisted and overcome. That is, a moral effort was required. Some Gnostics taught the universal salvation of humanity. Others limited salvation to only those who belonged in their group. Irenaeus taught that the harmony and unity of the true church with its one rule of faith made truth single and unified. Unity and harmony were located in sameness, that is, like begets like. By insisting group unity had to be rooted in a common doctrine, the Christians with their adherence to the authority of established leaders of the one institutional church 
constituted orthodoxy. Those who disputed that authority would by definition be considered schismatics. To shun the heretics was not promoting division, but rather recognizing the schism that the heretics had already established by being different. The problem of contamination was from the outside and had arisen through the corruption of Christian teaching by the introduction of pagan Greek thought. Purity had to be restored to the church by exclusion. So much for Greek thought in the early church. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary of Heresy is a belief or opinion that does not agree with the official belief or opinion of a particular religion. And a heretic is a dissenter from established religious dogma, one who dissents from an accepted belief or doctrine, a nonconformist. Historically, does anything come to mind with this definition? I'm asking. Further back in history. Keep going. About the same time. About the same time. Inquisition. The concept of the Inquisition was based upon Roman law and was concerned only with the heretical behavior of Catholic adherents or converts. The first Inquisition was established in 1184 against the Cathars and the Waldensians. It became a permanent institution in 1229. In 1252, Pope Innocent IV's papal bull explicitly authorized and defined the appropriate circumstances for the use of torture for eliciting confessions from heretics. In 1256, the inquisitors were given absolution if they used instruments of torture in eliciting these confessions. In 1542, Pope Paul III formally founded the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Roman and Universal Inquisition, the sole objective of which was to spread sound Catholic doctrine and defend those points of Christian tradition which seemed in danger because of new and unacceptable doctrines. And this is where the Reformation came in. Its task was to maintain and defend the integrity of the faith and to examine and prescribe errors and false doctrine. It served as the final court of appeal in trials of heresy and served as an important part of the Counter-Reformation. In 1578, the Handbook for Inquisitors spelled out the purpose of inquisitorial penalties, and you really need to understand this. Quote, For punishment does not take place primarily and per se for the correction and good of the person punished, but for the public good in order that others may become terrified and weaned away from the evils they would commit, unquote. Two of the most famous trials that the Inquisition presided over that have come down to us in history that I'm sure you studied in history class were 1456 and 1633. The first was Joan of Arc, the second was that of Galileo. After the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s, the institution of the Inquisition was finally abolished everywhere except in the Papal States. It had lasted for over 600 years. It survived as part of the Roman Curia and in 1904 was given the new name of the Supreme Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office. In 1965, it was renamed the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Just for fun, who was Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith from 1981 to 2005? Anybody know? I need a specific name. Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. Why did he resign as Prefect in 2005? He became Pope Benedict XVI. As prefect, he presided over the drafting committee from 1986 to 1992 that wrote the Catechism for the Catholic Church. If you haven't read its 800 plus pages, I suggest you do so. It's more than a little enlightening. In 1999, as prefect, Ratzinger signed jointly with the Lutheran World Federation a joint declaration on the doctrine of justification. Included in this agreement was the notion that the goal of the ecumenical process is unity and diversity, not in structural reintegration. 
In 2000, the congregation published a document which reaffirmed the historic doctrine and mission of the church to proclaim the gospel. The gospel. Not of anything, just the gospel. It also addressed, among other things, the question that one religion is as good as another and said that the followers of other religions can receive divine grace. It is also certain that, objectively speaking, they are in a gravely deficient situation in comparison with those who, in the church, have the fullness of the means of salvation. Billy Graham taught the same thing. So what does this have to do with anything? According to the Council of Trent, which met from 1545 to 1563, which has never been rescinded by the Catholic Church, and whose decrees are not only considered obligatory above all others, but they are also considered holy. If you were baptized, regardless of who you were and in what church you were baptized in, you belong to the Catholic Church, and only by baptism can you be saved. Allow me to quote the Council of Trent. Whosoever shall affirm that the true doctrine of the sacrament of baptism is not in the Roman Church, which is the mother and mistresses of all churches, let him be accursed. Whoever shall affirm that baptism is not necessary to salvation, let him be accursed. As to who may minister or administer, administer baptism, anybody, even the laity, in special circumstances, men and women, to whatever sect they belong. This power extends, in case of necessity, to even Jews, schismatics, infidels, and heretics. Proved, however, that they intend to do what the Catholic Church does in the act of her ministry. The question is put forth whether children can be lawfully baptized without the knowledge and consent of their parents. The answer from the Church is, if the parents are baptized, whether they are heretics or Catholics, their children may be lawfully baptized without their consent because their parents, by virtue of their baptism, and the infant, by the virtue of their nativity to their baptized parents, are subjects of the church. But in cases in which the parents are heretics, that is, Protestants, their baptized offspring ought to be separated from the parents, lest they become perverted. The parents may be deprived of their children without injury, as the prince comes into the place of the parents. Infants are not baptized in the faith of their parents, but in the faith of the whole church, and according to the will of Christ. Heretics, that is, Protestants, are subjected to the jurisdiction of the church, so that the church, for the preservation of the faith, can compel the parents by punishment, and can deprive them of their children and baptize them. Children become members of the Church of Rome whenever they are baptized, no matter who administers, whether heretic, schismatic, Jew, Turk, or infidel. All baptized persons are bound by the precepts of the Roman Church, whether written or traditional, and they are obliged to observe them, whether willingly or unwillingly. Furthermore, when they grow up to maturity, they are not allowed to be left to their own devices and choices, but are compelled to lead a Christian life by other punishments, besides exclusion from the Eucharist and other sacraments. We have also fully ascertained that those baptized by heretics are to be repelled from the unity of the Church and be deprived of those benefits which members enjoy. But they are not to be freed from the authority of its laws, all baptized persons are liable to be compelled by punishment to be Christians, that is, subjects of the Pope and under his dominion. The Council of Trent has converted the sacrament of baptism into an indelible brand of slavery. She claims her slaves and dooms them to indefinite punishment till they shall acknowledge her authority and bend their necks to her yoke. The principles of religious tyranny supported by persecution are a necessity necessary condition of true Catholicism. In her method of converting nations and individuals and her preserving them in the unity of her faith by the tortures of the Inquisition. I repeat the definition of a heretic, which is a dissenter from established religious dogma, one who dissents from an accepted belief or doctrine, a nonconformist.
If you look at your papers with me, because this gets a little involved, let's consider the biblical definition of our chosen words. Fine's Dictionary defines heresy as a choosing, a choice, that which is chosen, hence an opinion, especially of truth, and leads to division and the formation of fact. Such erroneous opinions are frequently the outcome of personal preference of the prospect of advantage. To be heretical is primarily denotes capable of choosing, hence causing division by a party spirit or factious. A sect is a choosing and properly denotes a predilection for a particular truth or a perversion of one, generally with the expectation of personal advantage. Hence a division and the formation of a party or sect in contrast to the uniting power of the truth held in toto. A sect is a division developed and brought to an issue. The order divisions and heresies in the works of the flesh in Galatians 5 is suggestive of this. When Paul was accused before Felix by Ananias the high priest, Tertullus the orator spoke for Ananias, accusing Paul of being a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes in Acts 24. Paul's answer was, I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. The accusation was one of sedition and therefore disturbing the Roman Empire. Paul's answer was that all he had done was to go to the temple, as he was allowed to do under a general edict that had been given in 42 AD, which had confirmed the Jews the right throughout the Roman Empire to live under their own law. The Jews called him a ringleader of heresy, but Paul said that he was true to the God of his fathers, and so could therefore not be guilty of what he was accused. By calling it heresy, Paul turned it from a political argument to a theological one, over which the Romans neither had jurisdiction nor any interest. The Jews were the problem, not he. Two years later, the Jews were still accusing Paul, and he ended up appealing to Caesar, as was his right as a Roman citizen. In the beginning, the sect called the Way had been extended the same courtesy as the Jews in their practice of faith. What the Romans were not ready for was that, unlike their Jewish fathers, the sect called Christians would be in their cultural faith, would serve as human torches for Nero's depraved garden parties, would be willing to fill their arenas as fodder for their wild beasts, and to be made sport of by their gladiators and would be willing to be burned alive for their Lord and Savior rather than to burn incense upon the altar for emperor worship and proclaim, Caesar is Lord. Forget the Jews. This made them Roman heretics. One of the most famous of all martyrs was Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna. He was student of the Apostle John and teacher of Irenaeus, whom we met earlier. When his captors came to the house where he was staying, Polycarp did not resist them. He offered them refreshment and asked if he could spend a certain time in prayer before he had to leave, which they granted. In short, his inquisition proceeds as follows. The proconsul. What harm is there in saying Lord Caesar and in sacrificing with the other ceremonies of preserves on such occasions and so make sure of safety? Polycarp, I shall not do as you advise me. Have respect to thy old age. Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Repent and say, away with the atheists. Swear, and I will set thee at liberty. Reproach Christ. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? Swear by the fortune of Caesar. Since thou art vainly urgent that, as thou sayest, I should swear by the fortune of Caesar, and pretendest not to know who and what I am, hear me declare with boldness, I am a Christian. And if you wish to learn what the doctrines of Christianity are, appoint me a day, and thou shalt hear them. I have wild beasts at hand. To these will I cast thee, except thou repent. Call them then. For we are not accustomed to repent of what is good in order to adopt that which is evil. I will cause thee to be consumed by fire, seeing thou despisest the wild beast, if thou wilt not repent. Thou threatenest me with fire, which burneth for an hour, and after a little is extinguished. 
but aren't ignorant of the fire of the coming judgment and of eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why tarriest thou? Bring forth what thou wilt. The people looked upon these fanatics as enemies of the state and atheists and were therefore undermining their own state and their own religion. Persecution would come to followers of the way intermittently for the next 300 years. The teaching of this Jewish sect had started out with a handful of zealots in an out-of-way city in Judea, eventually surpassing the might, power, and glory of the Roman Empire. What they took with them through persecution and prosperity wherever they went was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These Christians made a choice that was to eventually cause a great gulf to be fixed between the greatest and most powerful political machine mankind has ever known before or since and the truth. They had determined that the truth was by the standard of God's word. Everything else was heresy. Others were to take what the Christians believe and twist it to their own ends. Peter said they would bring in damnable heresies to their own destruction. The standard had been set. There was a specific faith, the faith, a specific body of doctrine to be contended for that had been delivered once and for all. Anything else was unacceptable. So what does this have to do with textual criticism? Much in every way, actually. In the early 1850s, when the Great Occult Revival took place in England, Westcott and Hort were founding members, active members, or officers in every occult association of which, were there, of which there were a half a dozen on the campus of Cambridge University where they were on the faculty. They shared their membership in one of their organizations with Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, the infamous, infamous medium and founder of the Theosophical Society. Theosophy means divine wisdom. And the group in which she shared co-membership with Westcott and Hort, her, critical, her forte was biblical criticism, and she used the writing of Bishop Westcott to undergird her arguments. In turn, she praised Westcott's advocacy of her philosophy. In spite of signing the 39 Articles of Faith of the Church of England, which was required for them to teach at Cambridge, Westcott and Hort were Gnostics. They had no reason to believe in the bodily resurrection of Christ or anything else taught in Scripture based upon the received text. Dr. Wade has written about their heresies and has countered them wonderfully from Scripture in his Heresies of Westcott and Hort. He also wrote Westcott's Denial of the Bodily Resurrection of Christ, which is on the book table. Westcott and Hort were true to their beliefs. They denied the Lord that bought them and brought to bear all the pernicious lies of Gnosticism into their writings. In 1881, Westcott and Hort paraded out their translation of the New Testament based upon the Gnostic manuscripts Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, from which all the modern versions are created. The Catholics have their own view of things. The infallible Council of Trent said that Protestants had no right to read or expound scripture, and therefore they must be wrong. Rome teaches that the scriptures are not plain to us, Even to the learned, many things are hard to understand, which therefore, to the unlearned, must be impossible. As decreed by the Index in 1757, no version of the Bible in the vulgar tongue could be permitted, and the Catholic Index is the list of books that Catholics aren't permitted to read. On June 29, 1816, Pope Pius VII published a papal bull against Bible societies in which he referred to the Council of Trent and pled its authority for refusing the people in Poland to read the Bible in their own language. He further stated that the Bible printed by Protestants was to be numbered among other prohibited books as listed in the index. Pius VII declared that Bible societies were a crafty device by which the very foundations of religion are undermined and this this needed to be remedied and this pestilence needed to be abolished as far as possible. Concerning Bible schools in Ireland, he said that they were invested with the fatal poison of depraved doctrines. Generally speaking, they were led by Methodists who introduced Bibles translated into English by the Bible Society that were abounding in errors with the sole view of seducing the youth and entirely eradicating from their minds the truths of the Orthodox faith. In Fanatical America, he wrote that the Bible in the hands of the people will always remain a fatal gift 
if not accompanied with the right interpretation, that a great multitude of people have been tempted to sin by reading the Bible, that the whole reasonable and religious world called aloud with Christ do not cast pearls before swine. It is only presumption which interpreted the Bible privately. Prida only did this in order to get power. Many countries have a Bible society to promote God's word. Thirteen countries came together to form the United Bible Society in 1946. Today there are 147. What motivates the UBS is that the Bible is for everyone. They want everyone to have, quote, its inspiring message. They are interconfessional, working with all Christian churches, including the Catholic Bible Conference, the Orthodox churches, and many international NGOs, including UNESCO. They are effectively the Bible Society for the World Council of Churches. They have a Roman Catholic Archbishop. They have had a Roman Catholic Archbishop as speaker, a Seventh Day Adventist sit on a panel, and a Christian scientist registered at their meeting. In 1964, at the Dry Berrigan meeting, the chief recommendation was that they were to prepare a common text of the Bible in the original languages acceptable to all churches, including the Roman Catholic. They were able to consider translating and publishing the Apocrypha when churches specifically requested it. In 2005, the president of the Italian UBS was in Pope Benedict's first mixed papal audience the day after his inaugural Mass. His presence at the event was the evidence of the standing of the UBS in the eyes of the Vatican. The Catholic Church now has representation and weighty input into the administration of the UBS which supplies 80% of the world's Bibles. The Bibles used are based on the Gnostic text of Westcott and Hort. Since the Catholic Church is approving modern Protestant Bible translations, and since the Council of Trent decrees still stand, and since the listing in the index still stands, and since the various versions are based upon the Gnostic text translated by Westcott and Hort, who were believing occultists and Gnostics, can anyone say damnable heresies yet? Peter said there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction, and many shall follow their pernicious ways. Solomon told us 4,000 years ago that there was nothing new under the sun. Then, nothing's changed. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also be led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will the real heretic please stand up? How about 354? That's a good one. Trying to sing songs about Jesus. Living for Jesus. When you come to the chorus, you can take the different parts. Thank you very much. She gave us so much. We'll never remember it all. And what we remember, we probably won't understand. (laughs) Very good. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. I thank the testimony by Chris. I didn't know those things about her. So much we don't know about people. We see them every year. We talk to them. And how she was influenced by experiencing and how the Lord took her out of that. Made you a Bible-believing Christian. Stand for the text. And her husband, oh, he, he really, when he talks, you know, what you, you know what he said and you remember it. It's a strong uh, message. And I was glad to hear Tammy offer him a foundation talk. We sing songs and we don't really know what we're singing half the time. We should pay attention to the words and some of the words we shouldn't even sing. Hi, Mrs. Cooper. (laughs) Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to sing 354 and I know you want to go. Uh, We have extra long time and I might not let you go. We'll stand up. 
See what happens. <laughs> Just don't escape, I mean. <laughs> We thought we were living, but when we give our life to the Lord, that's living. Oh, Christ, for thee alone. Some of us were saved when we were younger. I was nine or ten years old. I remember when I got saved. I remember my dedication to the Lord as a teenager, as a school. I went to Bible school. I said, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, Lord. And uh, I married Dr. Waite. We've been in Collins for 51 years in the same house. Sometimes I think part I said I would go any place. And this is where I ended up. And this is where I belong. And with all my heart, I believe we believe there. That we live, belong there. It's not some great big thing that I'm doing. I don't do anything. This is the biggest thing I do once a year. <laughs> so, let's try the second stanza. No. Living We're not going to do this one. This is very interesting. Seven reasons why we use the King James Bible with our children and youth. 
And it's by uh, Helen Holbrook. I don't know who she is, but she lives in Fredericktown, Missouri. And it's so good that uh, we can start over. Or Tammy will do it. And then I have a, something uh, before. Uh, I want to tell you about our uh, Dean Berg on Society News. If you didn't get it at your house, look for it up on the table. It's very, very interesting, full of material I'm telling about this our meeting today and then this one is something from I have a devotional book called uh, My Daily Bible Blessings for My Daily Bible Reading and uh, oh yeah I should be here yes <laughs> I just I, I'm so short I want to stand behind me she can hardly find me <laughs> of course I'm growing in other ways besides height so uh and this is, I want to read this to you. I'm sure you can't wait. I just want us to end up uh, talk, uh, thinking about something from the Word of God. So, I don't know where to go here. Uh, I don't remember people's names. Thank you. The first one is uh, from my daily Bible reading, and uh, it's called Delivered from Fear. It's a June 19 devotional, and I thought if we had time, I'd share it with you. It's from this Bible reading section that we read on uh, June 19th, is Psalm 32.10 and Psalm 36.11. And I know it's not June 19, but I thought I'd share this one with you. Okay. Here I am. I'm lower, lower than usual. <laughs> I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from my fears. I'm going to read most of this, but uh, my sister Audrey died when she was 20 years old of Hodgkin's disease. It was very sad in our family. She was a very gifted, beautiful, beautiful voice, uh, outstanding personality. Of course, she's my sister, so I'm telling you this, but she really was a wonderful person. And I remember when she had Hodgkin's disease and she had to go in for her autopsy, uh, not autopsy, biopsy. And um, when she came out, you know, we looked at her and she said, I sought the Lord and he delivered me from all my fears. And that was her verse. That verse has meant so much to me all these years. I sought the Lord and he delivered me from all my fears. You know, I should drink some water and maybe I won't sound as old as I am. Yeah, that's that one. I have one here that I always sign. I have to keep reminding myself. <laughs> I guess I'm 89 years old, and if I live to February, I'm going to be 90, and I can't quite comprehend it all. But some, and I don't really feel that old, but I'm not sure how old that feels. <laughs> This verse, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. I've chosen as today's meditation. And a very personal, it's a very personal verse to me. It's a scripture verse that comforted my sister when she had Hodgkin's disease way back in 1950 to 1952. I remembered it as if it happened yesterday. My sister was lying in a hospital bed at the community hospital in our hometown in Bury, Ohio. She just had a biopsy on her neck. A lymph node had been removed. She was groggy, coming out of the anesthesia. Our pastor had been with her before the surgery. They took her early. He knew hospitals, so he was there. We came on time and missed her. We were very concerned. She was only 18. She had graduated from high school at the end of the school year. She was tall and willowy, blonde and beautiful, very talented and a young woman who loved the Lord Jesus as her personal savior that was Audrey for graduation gift Uncle Clayton and Aunt Lucille took her home with them to Florida it was an exciting time for Audrey she swam in the sea she rested on the beach and for the first time in her life she got a suntan without sunburning after a few weeks it was time to come home 
I don't remember how she got home. She must have taken a plane. It was a Sunday morning. I was in church in the children's department playing the piano for the children. Without warning, Audrey appeared. There she stood looking at me over an old upright piano. I saw her. I did not notice her tanned face. I did not notice that her long hair was cut. I only saw her neck. It was swollen. It was humped out from a growth of some sort. What was it? Immediately the next day, Audrey was at the doctor's office. Without hesitation, she was in the hospital for a biopsy. It was so quick. It was so unexpected. We were told it was either Hodgkin's disease, lymphoma, or a common cold. Yes, we had never heard of Hodgkin's and knew little about lymphoma. Yes, it was an uneasy time for the Sanborn family. A time of shock. A time of unbelief. In a few days, the diagnosis was given. It was Hodgkin's disease. At that time, there was no cure for that cancer of the lymph glands. As an aside, many years later, in 1986, I think it was on that, my husband, Dr. Wade, had the Hodgkin's disease. It was like deja vu looking at him. At that time, there was no cure for the cancer of lymph glands. Nothing but some alternative remedies that worked for some but not for Audrey. There was only radiation, but there was prayer. I'll never forget the night I learned that my sister had cancer. She was five and a half years younger than I. I could not sleep all night. I went down in the living room and read a book. It was a large room. There I sat in my mother-in-law's beautiful parlor. I was in shock. Already my parents had my youngest sister who was brain damaged from birth injury. They had me who previously had been hospitalized for long three years with a bone disease. Now they had this, their perfect child. She was overtaken, overtaken with a killer disease. I was not in the room when Audrey learned of her illness. I did not see her face. I'm sure she was stunned. Yet when I saw her, and when others saw her, she whispered, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. In the devotional book, after each devotional that I wrote, I used something from my mother's. I found a notebook of my mother's. I found several of them, and they uh, every page had a little devotion on it. I decided to honor her by using them in the book. At the end, it says, GGG, GGS, GGS, that's my mother, Gertrude Grace Sanborn. His truth and shield, Psalm 91.4. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Though we may not understand, yet his word is true. The trial is hard, yet the promise is firm and sure and comforting. When we cannot face life, his word held forth as a shield protects us. We cannot fight. The truth himself holds the shield. He is the buckler. It's not what we think is true, but what the Bible says is truth. Let's uh, have a few silent minutes of personal prayer. Dear God in heaven, our Heavenly Father, you know us, Lord. We cannot fool you. You know what we think, what we don't think. You know what we do. You know our motives. We cannot hide them from thee. Help us to be true Christians. Help us to have pure thoughts and motives. Help us to be an example of Jesus Christ. Help us to be firm in our beliefs. Help us to take a stand though it's hard and we lose friends. Just help us to be true. Lord, as the song says, I must be true for there are those who trust me. People are watching us, Lord. We're special. We're special people to Thee. 
we have given ourselves to thee you have led us through the dark waters you have led us through the valleys and we've come out and we're coming out and we don't know how we'll ever make it even though we've made it in the past because today is so hard dear father forgive us for our doubting thee forgive us for our trespasses forget us not being the love that we should be which projects Jesus Christ and use us I pray for each woman here today I know some of them real well some I know a little well some I don't know at all but oh God you know every one of them and you them know them very well I pray for them we never know when a disease will strike us and within a few months or a year we will be gone and be home with thee and I always wonder if we say we love thee and we want to be with thee but we fight so hard to live we go to the doctor and we get well and we praise the Lord but this is how it is with human beings Lord you made us this way you made us want to live so Lord when you give us daily life and daily breath and daily strength and the Lord sometimes we don't even have enough strength for the full day you have to supply it as the day proceeds when you give us these things God help us to live for thee help us not to forget our consecration to thee dear father bless the men as they're meeting we don't know what they're talking about we don't know what they're talking about half the time but we support them we learn what they're saying we want to be helpmates to our husbands we want to be friends we want to support our pastors we want to be kind to one another but help us not to be kind so kind that we are we are can't think of the word yielding we are not maintaining a good testimony because then that really is not kindness it's pretense so father I could go on and on and I'm sorry I'm rambling bless each woman here consider their names being named help them Lord and help their husbands or their friends that we can be precious precious Christians and when people see us they'll want to be like us because we're like Jesus in his name Amen okay you're all